Welcome to the Chain Reaction Podcast, brought to you by the Department of Supply Chain Management at Arizona State University's W.P. Carey School of Business. With a rotating cast of faculty, alumni, industry experts, and guest contributors, this podcast aims to help listeners understand the people and processes that produce and distribute products around the world. In today's segment, we're going to do a retrospective and look back at some of the highlights from podcasts that we had in 2022. We begin our exploration with discussing supply chains and risk management. So without further ado, let's, um, let's begin. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. First, let us catch Thomas by the toe. So I'm going to love the first question to you. So here goes. Risk management is not a new thing. So we have done risk management pre-pandemic, but post-pandemic, the risk management profile or the risk profile has actually changed a bit. If you were to take into account all post and pre-pandemic risk and kind of boil them up and pick your top three, uh, what would that be and why? Well, I uh, you know, thank you for the question. And, um, you know, in, in some ways, uh, risk has decreased after the pandemic in some ways, uh, which is maybe a nice, fun, controversial statement. But I think we've learned a lot about our supply chains that uh, we didn't before. And I think the pandemic has helped highlight the vulnerabilities that previously we probably didn't even realize we had. So risk just... Uh, Quick academic is the likelihood of loss. And uh, the way I look at it, the three areas that I would say to, to, to look at are upstream, downstream, and, and midstream or uh, inside the organization. Uh, I mean, obviously upstream, uh, we have uh, known shortages, uh, but we also have what we, uh, we did some research recently on hidden product changes that uh, with the squeeze of of uh, on suppliers, they're making decisions that we may not even realize. And so upstream visibility uh, is probably one of the most important, both in, in, in where the supply is coming from, and, but also who's making decisions. The, uh, and we can get into shrinkflation if you want, Hatendra. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, midstream uh, it would be inside the organization. Uh, uh, risks occur due to decisions being made inside the organization all the time. And we also have research on that, uh, on ways in which personal preferences and choices influence uh, what, what gets uh, done. And, you know, that could, that could definitely be a problem, uh, particularly with promises being made uh, to your customers. Uh, Over promise, uh, you create risks. Uh, simply by promising too much. So being very careful uh, internally. And then obviously downstream to, to customers, one of the things that I think that is a uh, risk area to think about is when your customers are dependent on other sources, you're fine supplying to your customers, but other sources are not. All of a sudden demand drops simply because they can't keep up with uh, uh, the totality that they need, your, your downstream customers. So you could very well end up in a demand shortage simply because of other supply challenges that your customers are having. So there's a sense of a, the network effect. So I think upstream, downstream, and midstream need to be always looked at and should be part of any risk management program. Thank you. Arash, do you have anything to add or just vehemently disagree with Thomas? <laughs> No, certainly not a disagreement at all. I think um, all I can do is to compliment uh, what uh, what uh, uh, Tom uh, started. Um, I'll start with one element that, uh, as far as risk and the list of risks that we had, that uh, fascinatingly we did not include in much of the literature or the textbooks related to risk management uh, prior, and that is related to uh, labor shortage and, and skills. Uh, uh, it, I think that one hit us like a brick wall, so to speak, in recognizing that, uh, you know, particularly in uh, pandemics or elements uh, of disruption that affect uh, human nature or human health or 
uh, human behavior uh, at the personal level that has a significant impact uh, on a larger scale on, on at the systems level. So, and we're still dealing with it, right? Um, everybody is hiring right now, yet at the same time, we're getting used to having to wait, um, you know, at Starbucks longer for a coffee or Panera Bread or whatever it might be. So that's one. Um, the second one that has been um, something we've been um, advocating for for a long time, long time, more than 15 or 20 years, um, that is, and, and uh, Tom, you mentioned this um, uh, as well, is uh, related to visibility. Uh, to put more uh, context around that, folks don't recognize that almost 50% of disruptions occur uh, at uh, beyond the first tier, second tier, third tier, and, and upwards. And so, um, but regrettably, uh, when you ask uh, manufacturers, um, service providers, whatever, their visibility pretty much uh, stops at, um, at the first tier, um, you know, um, and I can give lots of stories re related to that, but I'll stop there by saying, you know, we just need to have better recognition of what's going on um, as far as what um, um, our, our uh, upstream tiers uh, provide. Uh, one example would be Mattel and lead paint from a long while ago as to how that created significant issues with them. Um, and then the, the third one is, uh, I'll, I'll go kind of uh, counterintuitive on this. Everybody talks about black swan events um, and, and perhaps COVID was a black swan event. So um, same with 9-11, Katrina here in New Jersey. Um, but the studies that we did is um, shows that uh, believe it or not, uh, when you look at the long run, uh, small disruptions, what, um, what uh, Tom mentioned uh, within the organization you know, these are little trickles, uh, droplets of damage, if you will. And so from an operations management standpoint, when you add those up, believe it or not, on a yearly basis, they add up to be quite a bit of damage. So um, I'd like to think that minor risks, uh, if we just do a good job of handling those, um, we can do a much better performance. You know, if we can just avoid small flus, I think uh, folks, uh, companies lose a lot more days of work uh, for uh, flus uh, or just a common cold than they do with regard to COVID. So something to keep in mind in that regard. Oh, that's a very good point. Uh, Kevin? Uh, I'm gonna go meta on you. <laughs> and so these are risks that are, are happening right now and will happen and dominate the landscape, I think, over the ne next uh, three to four decades. So climate change, both uh, in terms of extreme events, we've got a, a heat bubble over the southwest right now, for example, um, as well as changes in, in particular, in growing regions, so forests, fisheries, food. Um, I'll echo Arash and say labor, but at a metal level. So we've got, you know, migration is a is illegal immigration at one border is our obsession, but migration is a huge macroeconomic issue across the globe, and coupled with that are demographics. And if we think climate change has some uncertainty in terms of its impacts, um, demographics are predictable and knowable. We know there are some tidal waves coming there. And I'd say the third uh, meta risk is the end of whatever. So if we're going to have, if we end up having some type of uh, macroeconomic uh, transition, uh, the end of globalism, the end of democracy, whatever it might be, um, that sounds a little risky to me. So we next move on to last mile transportation and how Amazon is cornered the market in last mile transportation in supply and logistics. Discuss their recent research uh, on last minute uh, supply chain transportation issues and how we might be able to utilize those findings in other aspects of supply chain management in what they found. Now in the article, they were able to discover that Amazon's decision to vertically integrate increases significantly the mileage necessary to deliver parcels in the zip code areas where the integration occurs. This, according to the findings, has added a dollar and 36 cents per package per delivery, which has made Amazon less competitive. We have a series of questions we're gonna ask uh, our authors today. And I'm gonna start, if I could, with you, Elliot, 
and ask how does Amazon's decision to integrate their retail platform with fulfillment affect the last minute industry or last mile industry? Okay, thank you. Um, so, j- j- yeah, so j- just a, a quick clarification. The, you know, Amazon by vertically integrating um, to the last mile uh, and performing their own deliveries are able to increase their own efficiency. Um, and uh, the, the, you know, the reason why they can do that is because um, they, they have a, uh, the economies of scale to be able to accomplish that. So as Amazon became larger, um, they reached a point where the volumes that they were handling for deliveries made it possible for them to perform um, these activity internally. And so they vertically integrated uh, into last mile deliveries. And um, so the, the whole integration of Amazon um, and its retail platform um, allows them to uh, leverage these economies of scale to achieve savings that uh, they wouldn't be able to obtain uh, had they continued uh, depending on um, third-party uh, service providers. Um, naturally, the, the integration by Amazon to the last mile will affect the profitability of um, these uh, last mile delivery uh, service providers because they are losing a uh, major customer in their um, deliveries. Uh, So, you know, just from a simple economics uh, point of view, activity-based costing shows that uh, if you uh, decrease demand for a service, uh, in this case, uh, a a uh, third-party service provider uh, sees a decrease in the demand uh, for their services, it's going to increase their marginal cost. So uh, as a result, um, they're going to have an increase in the cost of delivery that's now going to be apportioned among fewer parcels, leading to higher per unit uh, fulfillment costs. And uh, so, you know, these costs are going to be exacerbated when you are considering markets that are harder to serve because either they're more remote or require higher uh, service level uh, levels, like uh, faster deliveries. And so, um, you know, these are some of the insights that the paper uh, offers to, to underline some of these um, effects that um, the integration by Amazon has on its uh, now competitors, uh, the third party delivery services uh, providers, uh, and we focused particularly on one of them uh, to understand uh, these effects. So it's not a industry-wide analysis. Uh, right. We do is based on one part. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, Lena, is there something you'd like to add to that or another aspect of that that uh, comes to mind for you? Uh, yeah, um, so... I think uh, like uh, Professor Robinovich uh, mentioned about that, we're looking into how this effect or the negative impact on the operating cost of this one firm we're uh, looking into um, because of the Amazon's vertical integrating its retail platform and its last mile operations. And so we're able to observe in the data is that we saw the negative impact is uh, negatively moderated by the service level uh, of the routes. So if we say there's a higher um, faster deliveries being offered in the route and the negative impact is uh, further uh, exacerbated and also for the remoteness of the route. And what we're not able to observe from the data, but we're able to provide some implication is that Although this is one firm, uh, it also served 200 other retailers. 
So because of Amazon's vertical integration and its decision to withdraw from the platform, uh, we will be able to offer implications on how would this affect the pricing strategy for the, the other retailers. Uh, that also, sorry, what happened to my lines? <laughs> Um, that use this platform also uh, for their uh, last mile deliveries. Perfect. All right. Thank you. And Harish, um, anything else you'd like to add to to that in examining how Amazon having this multifaceted idea of having other companies they also do transportation for for that last that last mile delivery. I think uh, Professor Rabinovich and uh, Lina Wong have perfectly uh, summarized everything that we did. So the broad implications on other, um, so this platform also, or this this last minute delivery firm also serves 200 other retailers. So this increase in costs need to then be compensated by these other retailers. So there is uh, an issue of um, uh, Amazon's vertical integration creating an externality on the pricing strategy that this firm could impose on um, the other retailers. So their fulfillment cost could increase and that could affect their pricing strategies too. So uh, that is a concern for uh, you know, potentially policymakers um, who monitor competition levels in the economy. Uh, Lena first and Harish, if I give you each 30 seconds to a minute to kind of add your little piece to what uh, companies or individuals can do um, to mitigate some of that. Uh, what what you might suggest or how they can implement knowledge of that to make themselves more efficient or more competitive. Melina, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think our paper is providing, uh, like both um, Professor Rubinovich and Professor Gouda touched on, it's a very complex issue. So when um, either government or Congress act, when they're looking at this picture of should we give more control to those platforms, they shouldn't just look at the one particular operations or uh, the performance. Uh, for example, they shouldn't just look at their own operations or how would that in fact, a particular delivery performance, but they should look at the overall picture of how consumers' welfare are affected and also the especially the smaller delivery companies in the industry. Sure. Thank you for that, Lena. Harish, um, again, on the small company uh, aspect, um, ideas. Um, I think I'll uh, briefly discuss the regulation issue. I think regulation is a double-edged sword. So sure. it's got to be careful about, uh, so, so that, um, there are efficiency gains uh, through such vertical integration, um, but um, it's also, um, so, so there are efficiency gains and um, but it could also intensify price competition across retailers. So net net, I don't know what the, or we don't know what the um, uh, eventual outcome is. So uh, it remains to be seen um, what the eventual outcome is. We now turn to food in the supply chain and all those issues that we've been witnessing over the course of the past year with supply chains and food. What are the top three issues related to the food supply chain in the US? Thank you, Irina, and um, very, very timely topic. So pre-pandemic, um, the U.S. food supply chain, and I'm focusing on the U.S. food supply chain, was actually humming. Um, we are and were nearly self-sufficient in food. We do import some, anywhere between 5 to 10%, but mostly we are uh, self-sufficient in terms of the food. COVID was a trigger that actually appended uh, our delicate supply chain. And um, from my opinion, um, and uh, I would love to hear what other panelists would like to say, there are three key issues in the US food supply chain at this moment that are causing issues. One of them is labor. We have a lack of labor. COVID caused a lot of uh, labor to get sick. Whatever labor is available is now very expensive. And uh, that's causing some big issues uh, upstream towards the farms. And uh, the second one is rising prices because of um, fuel prices and labor prices overall, uh, just lack of raw material across the supply chain, we see, a lack, uh, 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 we see some rising prices. So that's number two. The third one um, is actually interesting and I've been thinking about it a lot is inequalities in our supply chain 
and rising of oligopoly that was hidden before pre-pandemic, but now it has emerged as a bigger issue where upstream small farmers have less control and they make much less and they have to utilize a lot of their um, uh, produce and animals while the downstream uh, big processing plants and larger companies have a lot more control over the supply chain and could also be causing some of the price increases that we are seeing. So I'll stop there. Joe, do you have anything to add to that, please? Um, I, I just uh, build on what Hitchinger said real quickly uh, to say during this during COVID shutdown, um, we had this bifurcation where everyone ate from home and no one went out to restaurants. And you started seeing all these articles about these farmers who literally had to dump milk and actually kill animals and throw them out. And the reason was is because they had set their supply chain up to support restaurants and um, kitchens that served school children and things like this, and they no longer were. And so the supply chain was not flexible enough at the time to reroute all those supplies. And so those supplies literally had to be thrown away because cows got to get milked, right? Um, and so there were literally thousands of gallons of milk going down the drain. And, and what this means from a broader supply chain perspective is capacity is over a period of time, right? As soon as an airplane takes off, that capacity is gone, right? And so we lost a lot of capacity in the food supply chain in the US and um, we're going to be suffering trying to make that up for a very long time. Tim, do you have anything to add? Right. No, I agree with, uh, just to follow up on your final point, Joseph, I think that was the big learning from from COVID was exposed this lack of resilience. You know, we've developed the most efficient, arguably the most efficient food supply chain in the world over the last 100 years we don't really think that much about resilience. And that's really what it what it exposed. You know, we had these firms that were locked into either food service or retail contracts. And I think a lot of those assets were dedicated to one supply chain relative to the other. And I think we exposed that lack of, lack of flexibility. Um, I was speaking at the Kansas City Fed a couple of weeks ago, and there was a SVP from Cargill speaking there too. And he said exactly the same thing. And from Cargill's perspective, you know, one of the largest food suppliers in the country, he said exactly that, that they have been investing in flexibility and they referred to a lot of those sorts of things that we need to do to re retain flexibility. He didn't say losing capacity so much as just reorienting and repurposing the capacity that they have. We next move on to how supply chains are impacted by weather. I know that you and your team uh, have developed a, a means by which um, to look at, at supply chain risk that may exist deep in the supply chain um, for a commodity like sugar or cotton. So for example, if I'm gonna give a 30, thousand foot overview if if we were looking at let's say the impact of drought and water availability and we had a particular commodity what does this method uh, provide to the the manufacturer sure so we've developed a tool that we've called commodity mapping uh, pretty simple and uh, for any agricultural commodity um, we have developed a, a way to take whatever information a company has. So maybe they know um, the location where it's grown. That's great. Oftentimes that's not the case. Um, oftentimes they'll know where they purchase, you know, the, the companies located that they purchase from. Um, and so we've created a model based on import and export statistics, which are publicly available. So we can kind of back in through the trade network to get to, okay, this is highly likely where your supply is coming from. Uh, so where your supply is grown. And then we can look overlay water risks. We can look at um, labor risks. We can look at a variety of different risks that are regionally based um, and, and overlap with where that, that crop is produced. And then we could create kind of a, rich, a risk matrices that we, that we give back to the company and talk to them through, you know, again, maybe this is where you need to have some bridging or buffering strategies with your suppliers um, to understand if you're actually sourcing from these regions and regions and how they are how the suppliers are mitigating or, or managing those risks. Excellent, thank you. Uh, let me pose a, a question to the whole panel. Um, you know, those of us, and it might include uh, all of us here uh, on the panel, who think about risk all the time, 
Um, we don't have to be convinced uh, of the, the impact and severity. But can we talk to the human element of within a purchasing organization, within a supply chain management organization, um, what are your recommendations to others of how to create a risk sensitive culture um, that attends to these really extra, um, extra efforts and practices that one has to engage in to be uh, a little bit safer? I'll jump in. I, you know, this, this whole idea of risk management um, at our level and at the personal level is something that nobody really wants to pay attention to until a disaster occurs and there's a problem. So to get people aware of and thinking about it really requires an investment of time and a buy-in at the highest level of an organization. The highest level of the organization has to push the concept that you need to spend your time working on this because it's important to me and it's important to the organization. Additionally, I think there's an educational effort that needs to happen and discussions that can happen at the lower levels so that when the lead management says, this is where we need to go, those folks will understand and buy in. Because if you don't get buy-in from the folks who actually have to do the work, you're just wasting your time. And we all know that I don't plan on buying extra toilet paper before the hurricane until the day before. I mean, maybe three days. If I'm really good, it's three days before, maybe a week before. Uh, actually, I have a warehouse storage bin where I keep a, a week's supply of toilet paper and a few other essential items I won't name uh, because we have so many hurricanes. But, you know, I didn't do that when I was 30. You know, so there's an awareness that's required, education that's required, a buy-in both at the, at the worker level and at the management level. And it's very difficult to do unless you're like Austin and have a command and control system <laughs> where you can enforce that. It's hard to do at the state level, but um, so that's, that's what I would say about that. Thanks. Austin, I know it's not as simple as just telling people what they need to <laughs> do. And I certainly have observed, uh, and, and I'll tell you directly, every, everyone I talk to, I say, you know, you want to know a, a good company at risk management, look at what Intel does, you know, and Intel's commitment to safety and risk management always occurred to me as something that were, it's not a coincidence that a, a safety right. culture is a risk sensitive culture. And, and, and I think that's the key you touched on culture, right? Is it really part of how you do business and, and, a lot of the success we've had with risk management is it's really built in and operationalized into how we conduct the supply chain. It's not a bolt on or a special program that, you know, only this portion of the organization is responsible for, but it's really everyone's responsible for it. And, you know, I think of the cliche and, and for those individuals that may not have uh, maybe been as enthusiastic about risk management, um, COVID certainly uh, allowed a number of folks to, to get religion about risk management and, mm -hmm. and they've kind of seen the light. It's, it's, it's the cliche, right? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And uh, if you didn't know that before the last couple of years, you, you certainly learned that lesson now. And so we really do try and embed it in and how we do business. It, it starts with, you know, all the way up at supplier selection, that risk management um, slant and view right? When you're, you're selecting a supplier, um, where are they located? Do they have more than one geographic location? So that if there is a disruption, whether it's geopolitical or weather disruption, are they going to wipe out your entire supply chain because they only have one manufacturing facility in this location? Or do they have multiple locations? Are you going to single sole source? Or are you going to multi-source? How much inventory do you carry? All of that's built in up front. And, and you're making those risk tolerance decisions uh, early on. And, and then you know what your backup plan is if you need to go to it. So a, a lot of the success where we, we've seen and been able to maintain the supply chain flow despite, despite disruptions is because all of that was built uh, and, and put into place years ago. And when there is a disruption, the folks know what actions they need to take because we've audited them on it. We've drilled them on it and put them through um, potential scenarios. So they know how to react like anything else. It's never going to be perfect and you can't predict all of the variables, but as long as you have the key components, the 80% of it Im embedded, you're, you're going to be in pretty good shape most of the time. 
we round out our retrospective of looking back at our podcast of 2022, examining, as always, Christmas and the supply chain and how it might just be Santa Claus that originated the supply chains that we know today. And if I could, Eddie, I think I'm going to start with with you with a question, uh, mainly because of this wonderful time of year and the fact that supply chains are created around this Christmas uh, environment. What type of global supply chain infrastructure is required for Santa Claus and his team to make Christmas a success? So I don't think anybody really knows, but if we think about it, I mean, it's kind of a, think about what it must be like for Santa. Santa has continuous growth it was probably easy when he first started you know there were hundreds of thousands millions of kids now we're talking billions of children all over the world expanding demand uh, but at the same time you know technology has changed so you know i'm thinking on, on the one hand you have you have to keep up that naughty and nice list metadata probably helps with something like that um you know coming out with new toys and manufacturing those toys. There's probably some, you know, he's got the elves, but there's limited elves. And so you probably have some outsourcing going on. Uh, as far as storage would go, because the things will be all delivered all at one time, there's probably a lot of warehousing going on. And from what I've heard, <clears throat> I'm not sure about this, but from what I've heard, there are times where he actually hides the gifts inside the parent's house. And, uh, and then like that, it's easier to kind of make the final delivery. Uh, I'm sure he's probably using three PLs. There's probably parent coordination going on, uh, some tracking of, of product and quality control is very important. Nobody wants to get their gifts on Christmas and then find out that they're broken. Um, I'm sure, again, we don't really know exactly what's going on, but I think as we see trucks driving out around town, as we see those warehouses that we're driving past, I'm sure that Santa is utilizing some of those resources because making all those deliveries at the right time on the right date, it's pretty challenging. Um, I'd, I'd be interested to see what others probably think uh, might go into that. Well, on, on, on that note, uh, Eddie, um, Elliot, if I could ask, what is the effect um, 
we are seeing in supply chain issues during the holiday season that might touch on on, on part of what Eddie is talking about with this uh, collection of consortium Santa Claus is using to get those gifts to us uh, right at the nick of time. So there's always um, every every oh, I, I guess you know almost every year uh, a story about. Uh, in the online space, delays and uh, orders not fulfilled on time. And, you know, I think part of it is due to the many different parties that uh, take place that collaborate or at least try to work together to make uh, these deliveries happen. Um, you know, the the, the case of um, companies like Amazon that, um, uh, you know, over the past 10 years, they've uh, decided to become a lot more self-sufficient when it comes down to uh, last mile delivery um, and rely and not depend as much on third-party logistics providers like FedEx and UPS. It's a good example that illustrates how, you know, some in some instances, um, there is a, a, a need for companies to be able to um, have uh, their own capacity to respond to uh, disruptions and uncertainties that uh, will inevitably uh, uh, prop up in the in the in the in the uh, holiday during the holiday season when demand spikes. So that combination of uncertainty demand, uh, both on the demand and the supply side, uh, makes uh, uh, supply chain uh, partnerships uh, very, very uh, brittle, very fragile during this time of the year. All right, that, that certainly makes sense, Elliot. Th thank you. Hatandra, if I, if I can turn it to you, uh, based on some of those issues that we're seeing, how is that impacting um, shopping in general and online shopping uh, in particular uh, in this digital age? Yeah, no, I, I, I loved how Eddie was talking about hiding gifts in the parents' houses. Uh, Eddie, we all teach that in our classes as vendor-managed inventory. <laughs> <laughs> Without any service level agreement. <laughs> um. So here's, here's my take on this holiday season. The heavy lifting by Santa and by most of the companies happened during the summer. So what happened was when, when there was a lot, uh, at, when we are today here at, in the month of December, uh, the supply chain is not stressed at all. The last mile is, but the supply chain is not stressed at all. Most of the most of the vendors, most of the retailers, including Santa Claus, because they were worried about supply chain issues and uh, getting the um, right quantity, getting the right product, they ordered a lot in in the summer, and that's the reason you hear that we, we didn't hear anything about Santa because he gets a list. He is uh, built to order, while the rest of them are built to stock. So they forecasted. And you started to see their inventory going up and overflowing inventory. Now, the key this holiday season is going to be if these retailers ordered the right thing and will they be able to sell? But the problem that we are seeing at this moment is um, uh, a mismatch between what the consumers are buying versus what the retailers ordered. So that is going to show us some interesting results come January. You will see some uh, retailers realizing they just ordered the wrong stuff. And uh, some of the other retailers uh, are just laughing all the way to the bank. The jury is still out. Thank you for joining us for the Chain Reaction Podcast brought to you by the Department of Supply Chain Management at Arizona State University's W.P. Carey School of Business. Please reach out to us at wpcarey.sem at asu.edu with SEM news and concepts you would like us to discuss in a future installment of the Chain Reaction Podcast. 
Also remember to check out our website for additional news and additional resources that you can utilize. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you again for our next Chain Reaction podcast installment.